Okay, now we good to go. And we're just going to pick up right where we left off uh, yesterday. You remember where that was? We were messing around with expressions. It's the form f of x plus h and getting a little experience simplifying those things. Let me do one more example, a more complicated example. All of our examples we did yesterday were quadratic, so they all ended up working out in basically the same way. Let's see if we can do something slightly more complicated. Let's let f of x be a non-quadratic. Let's try f of x equals one divided by x. And let's well sort of these problems are in their final form when we're looking at expressions like this. And again, we're kind of looking ahead of it all. So the question of, well, why would we want to look at fractions like this is one that we haven't answered yet. It will um, it was originally scheduled for Thursday. I think we're going to kick it to Monday of next week, but we will get there. For now, we're just getting some practice or some review of working with function notation and a little algebra as well, a little algebraic simplification. So remember sort of how this works. X plus, well, here, X is our input, and our input appears in parentheses on the left, and it appears on the right. If you're replacing your input on the left with X plus H, you're also replacing your input on the right with X plus H. So, To look at f of x plus h isn't particularly complicated. We just replace x with x plus h. The issue here is, I haven't written it on the board, but if you go back through your notes from yesterday, or um, you just kind of remember what we were doing. Yesterday, we were not just finding expressions, we were simplifying them. So when we had a quadratic factored, we foiled it out, stuff like that. And that's kind of the real issue with this problem. The reason that I said, I think it, thank you. The reason I said that I think it's maybe a little trickier than those quadratics. I mean, when we see when we see a quadratic, we can foil it. That's something we've been doing for years. It's sort of baked into our mathematical DNA at this point. It's much harder to see how a fraction like this could be simplified. Well, actually, does anybody have any thoughts on this? Anything that seems like a sensible first step? The H's. They're the only thing really too much alike and on different sides of the. Yeah, that's true. We're going to need to get rid of the H's. I do agree with that. Um, 
what we could do to get rid of the H's, for example, would be to divide top and bottom of this big fraction by H. If we did that, we, if I'm, if I'm not doing something very silly and not making some kind of elementary algebraic error, we would get to that. Um, now that we just have, and, and I think that's a fine place to start, I think we can keep going though. I think there's something else we can do, which is that if we can subtract fractions, I mean, we know there's a process for it. We get a common denominator and then we mess around with the numerator. So that's something else we could potentially do, get the common denominator and then do the subtraction. And uh, first of all, thank you. I should have said that earlier, I always, appreciate when students participate. Let's, um, let's try now that we just have this subtraction to get a common denominator. So we have an X here. We need an X here. Our common denominator is going to be x times h times x plus h. We have an x plus h here, so we need an x plus h here. We have an x here, so we need an x there. Um, does everybody see, I mean, I sort of said this earlier, sometimes it's really more the algebra than the calculus that trips people up. Does everybody see where this common denominator is coming from? So I'm seeing a head shake. Let me talk about this a little more. On one side, we have an H and an X plus H. On the others, in the other fraction, we just have an X and an H. So what do we have in common? Well, we have these H's in the common, so that's fine. What do we need for this and this to be the same? Well, we have an X plus H on the left. So if this and this are going to be the same, we're going to need an X plus H on the right as well. And we have an X on the right. So for this and this to be the same, we're going to need an X on the left as well. And you see that when these are the same, what they are is X H times X plus H, which is what I said had to be our common denominator. So to get the common denominator, I know this is in a sense elementary, but in another sense, maybe you haven't done this since you were kids. I mean, once you sort of get into higher math, you're not subtracting a lot of fractions anymore. So remember how we get this common denominator. To get an X here, we're going to multiply both the top and the bottom by X. And to get an X plus H here, 
we're going to multiply top and bottom by x plus h. And now we're, I know we're kind of crunched into a corner, but we're so close to being done. Now that we have the same denominator, we can just subtract the numerators. And always remember, if you're subtracting addition, that subtraction is going to distribute over the addition. So we're going to subtract this x and we're going to subtract this h. Well, x minus x, that goes away. x minus x, they cancel each other out. So we're just left with the h. And now let me move so well, even so, this whiteboard's in the way, but let me try to again because these tables are modular. I'm sort of assuming that if you can't see the board, you should move somewhere where you can. I mean, I'm trying to make sure everyone can, but also this board doesn't move. It is what it is. So I don't know how if everyone over there can see this, but negative h divided by x times h times x plus h. And there's probably one more thing we should do, which is what? <clears throat> simplify, thank you. And the particular way we're going to simplify is that those h's cancel. We have multiplication by h in the top, we have multiplication by H in the bottom. And we're left with negative one over X, X plus H. If you hate this kind of stuff, I guess good news, bad news. The bad news is that we're going to spend two sections, 3.1, 3.2, doing a lot of this. The good news is that from 3.3 onwards, we're never going to do it again. So I don't know if that makes you happy or sad, but we're not going to spend the entire course doing stuff like this either way. And I guess here's where I could have you do a problem, but we've spent a lot of time messing around with these examples. Maybe we'll move on and save it for 3.1. Whatever, I can just make a new frame. So now there's going to be kind of a miscellany, just to some stuff related to functions that we're going to use later in the course and therefore want to review this week. Let's remind ourselves of the domain of a function. So not every function can validly take every input. F of X equals one divided by X 
perfectly nice function f of zero. We cannot divide by zero. That's a division by zero error. So it's a perfectly nice function and a perfectly nice number, but that number cannot be used as an input for the function. We're speaking slightly informally here, but that's okay, I think. The domain of a function will be all of the real. You can do count to this on the complex numbers. We're not going to touch those at all in this class. So the domain is all the real, let's see, all the real numbers. that do not give errors when you plug them into the function. Maybe a slightly more elegant way of saying that would be all the valid inputs. And we'll talk about this a little. I mean, finding domain isn't really a calculus problem, but this is useful in a few ways. So let's kind of summarize just in reference to our standard functions. I said this before, but we're working entirely with the real numbers. So we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So therefore, if we have a square root, say 2x minus 3, whatever's under that square root, cannot be negative. It has to be greater than or equal to zero. And that gives us a restriction, making a bit of a zoomer there, that gives us a restriction on the domain. We can solve this inequality, This function only makes sense when x is greater than or equal to three halves. And if we take a look at this, let's see if I can do this without breaking everything. Let's see, let's, let me try to commit this to memory. The square root of 2x minus 3. You see, here's the square root. And over here, where x is less than that, there isn't any graph. We only have stuff over here where x satisfies that inequality. 
but really important for the purposes of this class. is the observation, which we, of course, already know, but we cannot divide by zero. So if we have, you know, f of x equals one divided by x minus two. This isn't defined everywhere. We can't divide by zero. So x minus two is not allowed to be zero. And x therefore is not allowed to be a two. And this, as I say, this is in a sense a kind of banal observation. We learn it when we're children, but it's going to have some kind of imp interesting implications in calculus. So that's probably just the one to really remember. And that's it for domain. As I said, the rest are still in section 1.1. That's fine. We have a lot of time scheduled for everything. But anyway, um, the rest of 1.1, as I say, is these kind of scatter shot topics that we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on any of them, unless, of course, anybody has any questions about this before we press the button and generate the new frame. Uh, anytime L of X is, is a negative number, you know, with the square root, that uh, uh, change the negative, you can't, you can't do it. You can't take the square root of a negative number. If 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 that was your question, thank you. Okay, I have I actually I started to say that I just realized I do have something else to say about the domain that is kind of calculus specific, which is that a lot. of real world functions have restrictions on their domains and we attend to maybe not what you'd think, but we tend to ignore those restrictions in the calculus. And in particular, we do calculus. on intervals of numbers. And because we can only study functions using calculus, if they're defined on intervals, well, we need our functions to be defined on intervals, even if they're not in the real world. And a kind of simple example of that would be if you're hiring a taxi. And let's say x 
is the number of miles that the taxi takes you and f of x is the cost and maybe f of x is a linear maybe there's some kind of pickup fee and then it's 40 cents per mile. Well, in the real world, you are not charged for fractions of a mile in a taxi. You can be charged for one mile or two miles or three miles and so on, but you can't be charged for 10 and a half miles. If we want to study this function using the tools of calculus, though, this isn't an interval, it's a discrete list of numbers. So we kind of gloss over that real world consideration and we say, okay, this function is defined on the numbers from one to infinity and the real world considerations, we just kind of brush aside. And that's not something that's going to come up a whole lot in this class, but I think because a lot of you are like not math majors, I think it's something to bear in mind that we frequently kind of cheat a little in order to use calculus where maybe we really, formally speaking, can. Now move on from domain and introduce or talk about piecewise defined function. These wise defined functions show up a lot in the real world, less often in the calculus textbook, but often enough to be worth talking about. And this occurs when you have a function that behaves differently in different pieces of its domain. So let's give a very classic piecewise defined function. And this will also sort of illustrate our notation. H of X is going to have a domain of all the real numbers. And h of x is going to be kind of a boring function. It's only going to give you one of two possible outputs. It's going to be either zero or one. And whether it's zero or one depends on the input. 
if x is less than or equal to zero. So if your input is negative, this function is going to spit to zero out at you. If x is positive, this function is going to spit one out at you. And those are the only options. So if you want to evaluate this function, say h of negative three. Well, first you have to ask, okay, where is negative three? Are we looking at this piece of the function or are we looking at this chunk of the function? Well, negative three is less than zero. So we're in the first piece. Therefore, h of negative three is zero. H of two is what? One. You just look at what piece two is in. It's in the second piece, so H of two is one. I, you don't really know need to know this, I guess, but I called this function classic. It's called the heavy side function, and it shows up in electrical engineering or actually a lot of applications, and it represents a switch being flipped at x equals zero. When X is negative, the switch is off. When X is positive, the switch is on. And once it's been flipped, it stays flipped forever. And this has a lot of applications. For example, we might come back to this occasionally just because it's what I did my doctoral research in. This can be used in cell biology when you're looking at budding yeast. What happens when yeasts bud is they start to bud, they start to bud, and then they stop. There are checkpoints in the budding system. So they stop, they stop, they stop, a, flip, a switch is flipped, and then reproduction occurs. So anything where sort of that switch flipping occurs, the heavy side function shows up. And in general, piecewise defined functions show up a lot in real world settings because all a piecewise defined function is, is a function that behaves differently depending on your inputs. You can find a lot of examples of that. Again, sticking with yeast. If you're studying yeast um, mathematically, yeast cells can metabolize oxygen either aerobically or anaerobically. So if you're trying to create a mathematical form to love for that, you need two pieces, one piece for anaerobic, the other piece for aerobic. So they show up a lot in those kind of real world settings, not so much in the textbook, as I say, but we will come back to them in section, what? In section 2.4, and then occasionally during the rest of the class. So maybe, Maybe we'll do another example. And instead of instead of you know having you write stuff down, I'll just sort of ask students to yell out answers. <laughs> 
Let's have three pieces. We can have as many pieces as we want. So there's a piece if X is less than or equal to one. Here's a piece if X is between one and 10. And here's a piece if X is strictly greater than 10. So depending on where we are, we're either X or X squared or negative X. So F of, F of zero is what? Zero, I'm hearing. Zero is less than or equal to one. So we're in the first piece and the input and the output are the same. F of zero is zero. F of two is what? Four, thank you. Two is between one and 10. So we're in the second piece and we're squaring our output. Was the bottom one supposed to be 10? Because otherwise, uh, yeah. You are correct, thank you. So speaking of which, F of 11, negative 11, thank you. So, there's piecewise functions. And still not done with 1.1 is kind of a freak. It's so it's so long. It's just because it's sort of assumed that this is all review. So they pack a huge amount of material in a single section. It's pretty unusual to have one section containing this much material. The next piece of material though is is really quick. And in fact, we could sort of get away with not talking about it, except that this gives, this is sort of a major application of calculus. So it's good to do it early in case sort of there are still students wondering what any of this is for. Say we have a function defined on an interval. So from A to B, the function might be well, the function might be defined outside of this interval, but we're looking at it on this interval. A function is increasing if it satisfies the following. For any numbers C and D in, in this interval, if C is less than D, F of C is less than F of D. And a function is called increasing because of its graph. If you think of a graph as a book that you're reading in the standard way, the standard English way, I should say, from left to right, then as you read from left to right, the function is going up. It's increasing. And one 
a major application of calculus is determining where functions are increasing and where they're decreasing. And I haven't defined decreasing, I guess, but it's pretty, uh, pretty natural. A function is decreasing if it's going down as you read from left to right. And obviously, we want to know whether functions are increasing or decreasing in a wide variety of cases. Like there are medications that become less effective if you take too much of them. That's why people can sometimes survive overdoses if they overdose too heavily. So if you increase a medication dosage, will it increase or decrease the effect of the medication? If you increase your um, advertising budget, will you increase or decrease your profit? It's a very natural thing to be interested in, and it's a major application of calculus. This next definition, well, I always, I sometimes forget to pause, but uh, does anybody have questions before we continue? Then let's finish up section 1.1 with one last definition. I'm I'm less sold on the importance of this definition than some textbook authors seem to be, but there are things you should know relating to this definition. This definition is the definition of even and odd function. f of x is called even if for any input c f of negative c equals f of positive C. Even functions are symmetric over the y-axis. That is to say, if you think of the y-axis as a mirror, you've got a function, and then you've got its reflection over in this quadrant. And even functions are named that way. Because if you have x raised to an even power, that's kind of the easiest example of an even function. And most functions are not even. Most functions are not odd either. I'll define odd in just a moment, which is why I say I think this definition is maybe less interesting than some textbook authors do. But you should know that the cosine the trigonometric function cosine is an even function. That's something that does show up relatively frequently in applications. And 1.3, um, which we 
I don't know, maybe won't get to this week. That's okay. But 1.3 is trade review. So I assume, I mean, it's in the prerequisites that you all at least sort of remember what the cosign is, but we'll talk more about it either later this week or early next week. A function is odd if f or negative c equals negative f of c. And these functions are symmetric around the origin. And again, they're so named because f of x equals x to an odd power is an example of an odd function. And again, our, um, our main application of this is going to end up being in trigonometry. the sign is an odd function. And again, we'll review sine and cosine in, um, in 1.3. That's it for today. I, I guess I'll warn you ahead of time. We might then we might use sort of our extended fast tomorrow. I'd like to definitely cover 1.2, and it would certainly be good to start 1.3. So depending on how long that takes, we might actually be here until 9.50. But we'll see. In any event, I'll see you then. Enjoy the rest of your day.